How would you like to be walled up in a little cell, brick by brick, with no door to get out, but there is a little tiny window that you can see out and that people bring food to you and you're walled up like that for the rest of your life. Anybody wanna sign up for that? I'm pretty sure that you are all saying, no thanks, I'll pass. And you're probably also thinking, who in their right mind would sign up for something like that, right? Well, I have news for you. There were people in the Middle Ages, they were called the Anchorites, and they did this. You see, they were religious hermits, if you will, or ascetics. And they felt that by walling themselves out, and, uh, or in, I should say, and making sure that nobody else could get into their secret little place and doing religious practices and prayers all by themselves, that they could somehow gain God's favor, appease his wrath, and become closer to him. They literally did that. Now, my question is, is, did that work? Did that get them closer to God? Well, according to our fourth wind warning today from Colossians, and you can now see the scripture and the theme, I doubt that it worked. You see, Paul is warning the Colossians against this very thing. Super strict asceticism where you wall yourself off, where you do all these man-made religious practices because you think it's going to make you more holy or it's going to appease God's wrath. Apparently, there were false teachers coming into Colossae and telling the Christians that this is what they needed to do. So what are we going to do today? We're going to look at this passage and we're going to find out that we need to beware of asceticism and we're going to learn the difference between being super strict versus spiritual in the true sense. The scripture again is from Colossians chapter 2 verses 20 to 23. We invite you to follow along in your own Bibles. Maybe you want to call it up on an app on your phone or tablet. Or if you want to use our pew Bibles, it can be found on page 1169. Again, this is Colossians chapter 2 verses 20 to 23. The Apostle Paul says, If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that all perish as they are used, according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom, in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Short passage this morning, that ends the passage. So, what does Paul give to us today in verses 20 to 22? To us and to the Colossians, he reminds us that Christians have died, if you will, to worldly, super strict, religious practices. Now you will notice in verse 20 that he refers to these by calling them the elemental spirits of the world. That's a strange phrase, isn't it? He also used it back up there in verse 8. What, what does this mean? Well, it, it literally means basic rudimentary principles of the world rather than from God, and they are religious in nature. Man-made rules, man-made things that were put forth at that time probably by Jewish legalists or maybe Gnostics. And Paul has a news flash for Christians. When you became a Christian, you died to all of that stuff. That stuff should not be a part of the life of a Christian. Later on, or earlier I should say, back in the book of Galatians, in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 9, Paul said this. He said, but now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world, whose slaves you want to be once more? Uh, see, when you go with that, you're going back to slavery. Now, in case you're wondering, well, what, what's he mean? What are these rules, these practices, these um, you know super strict religious rules? Well, we get a clue of it in verse 21. The rules focus 
on handling, uh, tasting, and touching. Now, Bible commentators tell us it probably refers to handling, tasting, and touching different kind of meats. That's because there were religious rules about that. One religious rule that does not come from scripture but became a part of Jewish tradition was this. You could not cook meat items and dairy products together. Meat and milk, don't cook them together. Bye bye Burger King Whopper with cheese. <laughs> I'm not going to have that anymore. Again, the rabbis cooked this up, and it's a rule you find in the Talmud, not in the Bible. I believe that's Talmudic. So the, boy, the point is this. As a Christian, um, avoiding cheeseburgers isn't going to make you more spiritual. Some of you are saying, hallelujah, Red Robin, here we come. It's good news, isn't it? So knowing that, here's a rhetorical question that Paul asks next that we see. And that's this, verse 22, I believe the question is. Um, why ascribe value to these things? Why would you ascribe value to these kinds of things? Um, it doesn't make any sense to do so. Um, now that's a good question. Uh, why? Well, you shouldn't. But you might have this question today. Is it a question for us that we need to answer. Do we need to be thinking about these things? In other words, do we say to ourselves, well, we don't have Gnostics or Jewish zealots around here uh, knocking on doors trying to get us to follow their religious rules, right? Do you have someone telling you, hey, I have a made up religious rule I want you to follow from a Gnostic group? Probably not, but in the church, we subtly do this sometimes. Liturgical churches may demand that the color of the pyramids be correct. Otherwise, you're not spiritual. By the way, they're green because this is ordinary time of Pentecost, and that's the tradition. And yeah, I'm glad we have them, but does this make us more spiritual? Or if we get rid of these pyramids, would we be in trouble with the Lord? Absolutely not. It's a man-made religious rule. In some charismatic and even Pentecostal churches, they may tell you when you're singing to the Lord, if you don't have your hands in the air, you're not spiritual. That's a man-made rule. And even in some Bible teaching churches, they will tell you things like if you're not using the King James Version, you're in big trouble. All of it made up. And it even gets more interesting when the government makes up religious rules. I'm going to give you some that are still on the books in this country. I don't think that they are uh, still enforced, but they are on the books. For example, did you know in the state of Alabama, it is illegal to go to church and to wear a fake mustache if it causes people to laugh. That's against the law. <laughs> oh no, I'd be in big trouble, wouldn't I? Or here's another one. In Nicholas County, West Virginia, <laughs> it's illegal for preachers to tell jokes from the pulpit. Gee, I'd be in trouble a lot by now. Or you can at least say, I have attempted to be in trouble a lot by now. Whether or not they're funny, I don't know. All of this is man-made stuff. And as Christians, we have died to all of that when we came to faith in Jesus Christ. So why do we make up more rules? That's the question that Paul's asking here. They're of no value. Why are you doing that? We should not. Moving on to verse 23, Paul says, these rules appear to promote strict asceticism, which is worthless. Now, what do we mean by asceticism? A good dictionary will tell you this, that asceticism, according to the dictionary, is severe self-discipline and avoidance of all forms of indulgences, typically for religious reasons. Does that make sense? That's what we're talking about. In other words, Paul's saying in verse 23, these rules don't handle, don't taste, don't touch, whatever. Um, they may appear to help foster uh, asceticism, strict religious practices, but even those are worthless. So why follow the rules that may give you wisdom to promote other practices which are also worthless? It doesn't make any sense. Now, what do we mean by different types of super strict asceticism? Paul tells us in verse 23, and the first thing, well, he, he mentions three things. You look in verse 23, 
the super strict asceticism, these practices that the rules uh, seem to foster, first of all, would be self-prescribed religious practices, um, false humility or asceticism, I'll explain that, and then severe treatment of the body. Those three things, okay? Uh, Self-prescribed religious practices, false humility or asceticism, and then severe treatment of the body. That's what uh, comes about through all of this, through following these rules. Um, it can trigger these. So um, let's look at some of these now. The first one I mentioned was self-prescribed religious practices. Um, these are worship practices, again, which people devise on their own. They're not from Christ. It's a misdirected zeal. And this has been going on for a long time because Paul warned about this to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 3 when he said this about some non-believers that Timothy was warning them about. He said, these forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. You understand that? The false believers were saying you have to abstain from certain foods and you can't marry that's what they said. Not biblical at all. So um, one example that I mentioned earlier was walling yourself up in a wall or in a room, brick by brick, with a little place to look out for people to give you your food like the anchorites did. That, that will not make you any more spiritual. That's a self-prescribed religious practice. Now, to be clear, self-prescribed religious practices do not include things like this. This is okay. This is the stuff that's okay. Fasting. Matthew 6.16, 6, Jesus said, when you fast or praying. Matthew 6.5, what does Jesus say? Similarly, when you pray. The assumption is we're going to be praying. We're going to be fasting. We're going to be praying. And also coming together like this to meet as the body. Hebrews 10.25, let us not give up meeting together. That's good. So if there are practices that the Bible recommends, yes, we need to do them. But ones that we cook up or somebody else cooks up that are not from the word of God, it's worthless. It's rubbish. Second category of things that are part of super strict asceticism would be asceticism or false humility. Now that may sound like double talk. What do you mean super strict asceticism includes asceticism? Well, this is where it gets confusing. The ESV uses the word asceticism a second or here to refer to false humility. It's a word that has uh, two different meanings. Okay, if you went to school, they called that a homonym in English class. A same word, two different meanings. For example, if someone says the word bar, what do you mean by that? The thing that you have on the wall in your bathtub to pull yourself up? or a place where people go to drink booze. I don't know, it depends on how you use the word. Well, asceticism can mean these super strict religious practices as we first said, or here particularly, it refers to false humility that people show. Um, what do we mean by that? Well, um, an example would be again, Matthew 6, 16. What did Jesus say about fasting? When you fast, yes, you need to fast. Uh, we should fast, that is, from time to time. It's a discipline that we should do. But he says this, when you fast, don't look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces in fasting to be seen by others. Hmm. You see, they're not fasting to draw closer to God. They want other people to see their cranky, gnarled face. I'm fasting. I didn't get anything to eat. Woe is me. How humble I am in order to get uh, recognized. That's the wrong thing. That's not what God would want us to do. A modern day example might be this. Someone says, yes, even though I was so nice and dressed up in one of my best suits and I had to go to an appointment because all those people and all those kids left such a mess down there in the kitchen after vacation Bible school, nobody else would clean it up, so I did it. I hope people notice that I did. That's the kind of attitude we're talking about here that is not good. And that's a type, you see, of this super strict asceticism. It's false humility. Now again, this does not include true humility, okay? What does Philippians chapter two, verses five through eight, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, 
who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself of no reputation. And it goes on to say he humbled himself, being obedient to death, even death on the cross. So Christ-like humility, yes, we need to have Christ-like humility, but false humility, where I appear humble to get people to notice me, that's the thing that we must avoid, Paul was saying that. And the third type of super strict asceticism that he refers to in verse 23 is severe treatment of the body. You might say, what's that? Do people actually do that? How many of you have heard of the practice of self-flagellation? Has anybody heard of that? We do. Oh, we have one hand there. What, what is this about? What it is, it's a man-made, super strict discipline where religious people whip themselves to atone for their sins they committed against God. And to prove this to you, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a very short video clip of... Uh, people practicing this over in the Philippines on a Maundy Thursday. Uh, I'll caution you, I, I think you'll be fine watching it, but it is mildly disturbing, and it's only about uh, 15 seconds or so, but this is exactly what we're talking about here. Take a look at this. That's so unnecessary. In fact, it's wrong because how can any of us claim to punish, take on the punishment for our own sins? That's why Jesus came into this world. And it can include other harsh treatments such as not keeping clean or taking a bath. Did you know back in 360 AD, some church history here, St. Athanasius of Constantinople wrote a book in which he praised St. Anthony, who was born in Egypt. And you know why he praised him? It's because Anthony wore a shirt made of hair and he never took a bath. I have no problem with the hairy shirt, but never taking a bath? P-U. And he thought that this would make him more spiritual and appease God somehow? See, this should not be part of the life of the Christian. Now, please be aware that severe treatment of the body does not refer to some biblical practices that may appear to be connected with that. For example, it does not refer to taking up one's cross and following Christ. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 24, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Meaning, that's okay. But what does it mean? It, it's an act of total surrender to God, that we are totally surrendered to Jesus, that if necessary, we should be willing to die if that's necessary. It's surrender. But what it's not about, it's not about, oh, I'm going to torture myself or kill myself to appease God. No, that's the wrong way. But doing it the biblically way, being willing, if necessary, to surrender our lives, that's okay. Also, disciplining one's body, or I'm sorry, <laughs> yeah, this practice of, uh, of, of serving in this way of severe treatment of the body does not refer to disciplining one's body in a biblical way. You see, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, in verse 27, Paul says that he even disciplines his own body. Let me read that verse for you. He said, I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. And what he means there is he's talking about doing the spiritual discipline so that the Holy Spirit can work in your life. That's okay. An example might be, rather than sleeping in every day until 12 noon, you get out of bed and you have a time of prayer and devotions. That's a body discipline. You forego laying around all day in order that you can have your time with God. That's good. That's a good thing. 
But we're not doing this, doing discipline in order to gain God's favor. There's a difference between the two. And also we would emphasize this, that severe treatment of the body does not include working out one's salvation with fear and trembling. Paul says this in Philippians 2.12. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. What does that mean? What it means is it refers to obedience as we grow in Christ. The way we grow is we continue to be obedient to him. And we do so with fear and trembling, that is, with a tremendous sense of respect and awe because we don't want to offend God by disobeying him. It doesn't mean doing things that are scary, hanging over a cliff or dumb things like that to appease God. No, it's rather obeying God and doing so with a healthy sense of awe. So do you understand the difference between the good and the bad, what he's talking about here? Many things that we do, if you will, uh, how we carry ourselves in our body, it's biblical. But this man-made severe treatment of the body, it's not. All of these things, Paul says in verse 23, none of these, and this is the kick in the head, none of these help curb fleshly desires. If you do all of these self-prescribed religious practices because you think it's going to help you to do better in terms of curbing the evil desires of the flesh, it doesn't work. The British Reformed preacher Charles Spurgeon put it this way, I have found in my own spiritual life that the more rules I lay down for, the self, for myself, the more sins I commit. Isn't that interesting? In closing, I wanted to share with you about a man you may have heard of named Hudson Taylor. He was a missionary from Britain to China, and he founded China Inland Missions. He was a medical missionary. And you know what Hudson Taylor did? When you hear this, you're going to think that, my goodness, he is the poster child of super strict asceticism. I mean, before he went to China, he moved into a very, very poor neighborhood in England near where he lived. And when he was in China, he shaved part of his head and he grew a pigtail. What? And, and, and also when the Boxer Rebellion hit, because he was over there during that time there in, in, in history when the Boxer Rebellion came about, and the ministry lost a lot of money and he did as well, when they came to give him some payback, if you will, some things that were deserved to pay him back for the, for the losses that the ministry incurred, he refused them. No, I'm not going to take that. You might say, that sounds like someone that's trying to appease God. Shaving your head, growing a pigtail, living with poor people, not taking money. But here's the difference. Hudson Taylor wasn't doing that out of asceticism. You know why he moved into that poor neighborhood? Because he wanted to learn how to minister to the poor. Do you know why he shaved part of his head and grew a pigtail? Because the community in China at that time where he was living, that's what the men did. That's how they carried themselves. And he wanted to be all things to all people. And after the Boxer Rebellion, when the ministry was devastated, why didn't he take the money they offered him? Because he was trying to show the humility, meekness, and gentleness of Christ to those in the government or whoever were offering the funds. You see, it wasn't about gaining God's favor doing these things religious practices, but rather it was God's love flowing through him. False teachers will always demand that we follow super strict religious rules and practices, but by grace we know that we are recipients of God's favor all through grace, not because we follow man-made rules. That's the difference between being super strict versus spiritual. Amen.